Euler, what he did, is something even more important. He went beyond the equations. He said, forget about the equations, forget about the actual formal apparatus. Let's just investigate the space of possibilities associated with the equations, and let's see if he has any structure at all. And if he has special, unique, remarkable points in it, in, in which we know everything is going to end up anyway. Let me give you a, a, a very concrete example, not one from Euler. Let me, uh, I'm going to create a space here, and I'm going to make it, he was Euclidean, although in reality they are not Euclidean. And I'm going to put a singularity here in the form of a point. All of these other points are also possibilities. But only this one is a singularity. And then you take a phenomenon like a soap ball. Now, everybody has seen soap bubbles, right? They are very simple. Do you take a piece of soap film and a piece of wire, you blow through it, out comes a perfect sphere. Now that by itself, if you think about it, is pretty amazing because the spheres are not easy to make. Everybody that has ever made a sphere out of wood or metal knows that spheres are tough. And yet, soap bubbles just come out by themselves, right? Now, if you get a dodecahedral soap bubble when they blow in the thing, I'll bet you you'll be scared to death. I'll bet you you have to go home and change your shorts, right? Because a dodecahedral, or a triangular soap bubble, oh my God, come see that. How does the millions of molecules in soap film find that form so easily, so instantaneously? But Euler would say, all those little guys, become attracted to the form of a sphere because the form of the sphere is the one that minimizes the tension at the surface of the sphere. Now, a point of minimum tension is singularity. Those are the types of singularities that Euler discovered, minima and maxima. And Euler would tell you, I can explain to you why it's always a sphere. Because in its space of possibilities, there is a singularity, which is a minimum, that acts as an attractor for all the possibilities. It doesn't matter where you start in the space, it will end up over there. So the Euler brilliant insight, we're talking about the middle of the 18th century, was that you could, you could see in advance what shape something is going to take simply by looking at its space of possibility, simply by looking at its universal singularities. And more than that, a universal singularity doesn't just produce one form, it produces many different forms. Think, for instance, of a crystal of common table salt, which has sodium atoms on the corner, you know, it's sodium chloride, chloride, and a chlorine atom in the middle. Now, every time you put sodium and chlorine in the same solution, they get attracted to the cubic form. Now, if you, if, if you don't believe me, you take a little bit of a table salt, pulverize it and put it under a microscope, and when you, what you're going to see are perfect little cubes. Right? Now, those guys become a cube also because they are minimizing bonding energy. In other words, they have the same singularity, a minimum, in their space of possibilities. Euler in the 18th century understood this. And Deleuze understood that this was the way to get out of the general and the particular. Because when you are talking about essences, when you are talking about the essence of a zebra subsisting eternally, and not as opposed to accidentally and necessarily, you are saying that between the actual zebras in the wild and that archetype zebra, so to speak, there is a relationship of resemblance. You know, actual zebras resemble the ideal zebra to a lesser degree. It is that variation in the zebras that, 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 that fogs this for us. If we could see clearly, we would just see the perfect zebra and the imperfections in the resemblance of the actual zebras. But what, what Deleuze saw when began, he began to study these things is that with universal singularities do not resemble at all the shapes that they give rise to. 
they can give rise to spheres, they can give rise to cubes, they can give rise to straight lines, as in the case of light. Light also follows a path that, that is the minimum distance, or the path that takes the minimum amount of time, which means that they are basically also talking about a point singularity. Now, if this had been it, it would not have been that much fun. But later came on another mathematician. His name is André Poincaré. There is some kind of accent somewhere in there. I don't know where it is. But he has it, he has it. He lived, of course, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. He was perhaps the last mathematician who could, con who could make uh, good contributions to every single subfield of mathematics ever since Mathematics has become a lot more disjointed, much more over-specialized. Poincaré was the last overall genius. And he discovered that there are all kinds of other different singularities. He discovered, for instance, singularities that have this form. They are lines instead of points, and they are closed like a loop. That they also have that capacity to attract things. And soon after he discovered them, we begin to realize that radio transmitters <laughs> that's my version of a radio transmitter let me put a little bit dial for a little better yeah. radio transmitters do what they do you know transmitters not receivers right because when you connect them to the wall and you turn them on they begin pulsating to a perfect beat and generate spherical with every beat they generate a spherical electromagnetic wave one after the other, and that series of spherical waves is what we call the signal, right? When you take your cell phone and you're looking for a signal, you're looking for those waves. On top of those spheres of electromagnetic energy, we can then modulate either the frequency or the amplitude, and you can get AM radio or FM radio, depending on what you modulate, the frequency or the amplitude, and send messages piggybacked on the signal. But if you don't have the signal, you cannot send any messages, as anybody who has tried to find the signal with a cell phone knows. You, cannot, you first need to get the signal, and then you make the phone call. Well, that signal is produced by that perfect beat. And when you go into the radio transmitter and try to figure out where the perfect beat is, you realize that there's not a circuit or a thing that is called the perfect beat. The perfect beat emerges spontaneously as the dynamics of the circuits and the electricity within the radio are attracted to a singularity that has the form of a loop. It's called a periodic singularity. It was discovered by Poincaré. So he began to add things to Euler. To us this is important because that means that singularities are an empirical matter that we can discover newer and newer singularities as we begin to explore newer and newer phenomena. In other words, you cannot say things a priori about singularities. Knowledge about universal singularities, even though they are abstract entities, continues to be a posteriori. You actually need to do the work and gather the mathematical evidence for their existence. Many other things happen to be like that. Your heart, for instance. It beats at a perfect beat. You can take some of the cardiac cells out and put them in a Petri dish and they continue to beat at a perfect beat. And yet there is not one single thing in there that says, this is a clock. This is what's producing the beat. The beat emerges just like the soap ball emerges spontaneously by virtue of the fact that in the spaces of possibilities, there is that kind of singularity. I'm getting to an end now. Poincaré also saw, although he kind of was horrified by it, what we today call a chaotic attractor. I'm going to draw one of them. That's called the Lorentz attractor after an American, who so happened to have a German name. A Lorentz, Lorentz was a meteorologist. He discovered that type of singularity in the 1960s. They are called chaotic attractors, but that is a misnomer. There's nothing chaotic about it. If you don't believe me, you know, look up when, when you get to the Wi-Fi hotspot, Google Lawrence attractor, 
and, and try to get at least a three-dimensional version. You know, Google is going to give you all kinds of images. Get an, a three-dimensional version rotating, and you tell me if that looks chaotic at all. It looks weird, it looks complex, but it doesn't look chaotic. It looks intriguing. It has an aesthetic properly to it. A better term would have been fractal attractors, because they do have that cell similarity at different, at different scales. Nevertheless, the very fact that we call them chaotic shows that we were scared about them. But there's nothing to be scared. A chaotic attractor produces order. It doesn't produce chaos. Chaos would be produced in a space that had no singularities in it. Because a space with no singularities, the trajectories that, that, that represent the history of a system would just wander around and around and around, and that's random. But if all of them get attracted to a Lorentz attractor, it doesn't matter how many little you know, drift it does, eventually it comes here and wraps itself around in a very small portion of the space of possibilities, and that is order. Now, I'm not going to start giving you examples right now because it's one we're just discovered, we're just beginning to see what systems in reality have chaotic attractors. 